and I'll talk loudly too. How's that? Is this okay? Okay. Well, thanks so much. This is an amazing turnout. So thanks all for being here. I'm very excited to give this talk. So for those of you I haven't met, my name is Matthew Pullman. I'm going into my seventh year of seminary formation uh, just next week. I'll hop on a plane and fly to Rome. Um, but this summer, I've been assigned here at St. Columkill, and it's been awesome. This is my last week. So exactly a week from today, next Wednesday, I'll be be going back, and that'll be my third year of four of theology studies, but I've already earned my philosophy degree, which is a part of college seminary. Before I get to Rome, I'll take a stop in Ireland to go watch the Huskers beat Northwestern. <laughs> 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 get the season off to a good start, and then I'll, I'll return and get serious in my academic work again. So this presentation is called, well, it's called the Scavi Tour. So firstly, the word Scavi is simply the Italian word for excavations. So that's what this is. I give tours of the excavations beneath the Basilica of St. Peter. But before we get into that, I'll just tell a little bit about myself and why I feel a, a great affection for whoever the Holy Father is, in particular St. Peter. So it was in 2005, I was in first grade, and St. John Paul II had just passed away. And uh, ever since then, I was very fascinated by him at the time. But ever since then, I wanted to be like him. And so with my first grade discernment skills, I thought the way to be like him is to be a priest. And so ever since then, for the last 17 years of my life, I've wanted to be a priest. And so here I am really, really close to ordination. So about a year from now, I'll be, I will be ordained a deacon in St. Peter's Basilica. It'll be a really, really cool thing. And then I'll come back in June of 2024 and be ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of Omaha. And then I'll be here to stay and not, not be going on for more studies in Rome. And I'm very excited about that because parish ministry this summer has been really awesome to actually build relationships and meet the people I'll be ministering to rather than sitting at my desk all day. Although Rome is really, really an incredible place to just sit. <laughs> so, uh, okay, well, let's get into this. Before I get into actual um, facts about the Scavi, we'll talk first who is Simon Peter, the fisherman from Galilee. So a lot of this presentation, it won't be such a virtual tour as it is what I think are the highlights of the tours I give, so you'll get all the most interesting parts right now. So Simon Peter, uh, we know from all four Gospel accounts, was the first one that Jesus called. So in the Synoptic Gospels, it's immediately Simon called by his brother Andrew. He's the first name of the apostles that shows up. And then uh, in Matthew's listing of all the apostles, he, he writes, first, there is Simon called Peter, he lists 10 others, and then Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. So he's the only one who has a designation next to his name first. There are 10 more, and then the 12th listed is the guy who betrayed Jesus. So there seems to be an importance in the ordering, first to last. And then in chapter 17 of Matthew's Gospel, uh, the tax collectors of the temple come up to Simon, now called Peter. Jesus had given him his new name. And he said, uh, okay, Peter, does... Does your teacher pay the temple tax or not? Because they were behind, it seems, on their payments. And Simon Peter said, actually, I don't know our, our stance. I don't know our views on this. So he goes to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, what are our political views, basically, on this? And he says, actually, I want you to go fishing, Peter. A funny way to answer this question. And he says, the first fish that you catch, you'll find a little coin in its mouth. And you'll pay half the shekel for you and half for me. And that is an actually really important story for us to know who Peter is, because all the 11 other apostles were with them at the time. So this tells us that only Jesus and Peter, who paid the tax, were old enough to be legally mandated to pay this tax. So we know that Peter was the oldest among the 12 apostles, too. And then there are also cool, um, well, there's research about how maybe the apostles were just in their 20s, and maybe even teenagers. So you would have Peter, the older guy, keeping everybody in line, and then Matthew, they needed an accountant for the tax collecting and things. And then John, they think, maybe was even as young as 12 years old, which makes sense with the, the Last Supper account of him lying next to the bosom of Christ. So um, it, it all fits. Peter, um, he's the oldest. The Pope doesn't have to be the oldest among the College of Cardinals, but we still look to him. We have Roman primacy, and it's all rooted in, in our four Gospel accounts. So that's Simon Peter, the fisherman from Galilee. So we've spoken about it. Saint, we'll get into sort of his rival in Rome, and that would be Emperor Nero. Before we do that, I'm going to tell a story called the Quo Vadis story. And this story was new to me when I got to seminary. It's part of our oral tradition as Christians. Um, nonetheless, it's not in the Bible. 
so that's why maybe you wouldn't have heard it by now. But the story is uh, the Christians were being heavily persecuted in Rome. There were, in fact, bloody persecutions from the time of Jesus' death all the way through the early 300s AD. And Peter is said to have fleed the city of Rome. So he was bishop first in Antioch, where the Christians were first called Christians there. And then he came to Rome, started the church in Rome. He was a bishop there. And as the persecutions got worse and worse, the story goes that he started to flee the city. And the Christians needed to come up with the reason of why did Peter come back? And so the Quo Vadis story that I'll tell is the answer that the Christians now give to this day. So Peter had fleed to the, the, the easternmost part of the city. He'd left the city gates behind him, and he sees a figure walking toward him with a cross in which there is the Lord Jesus. And Peter utters the words, Domine Quo Vadis, which is Latin for Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answers, I'm going to Rome to be crucified again. And Peter receives that, as an invitation to have Christ crucified in him again. So immediately he turns around, this happens on what's called the Appian Way. He turns around from the Appian Way and heads back toward the Vatican Hill where all the action is going on. So that's the story of the Domine Quovadis, where are you going? This would be St. Peter's Galatians chapter two moment. So St. Paul writes to the Galatians, um, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And this is Peter's Galatians two moment recognizing that Peter, that, that Jesus is going to be crucified in him. So he goes back to Rome, and he goes back to the very wicked emperor, Emperor Nero. So before Emperor Nero, there was Emperor Caligula, who started the heavy persecutions of the Christians. Um, emperor Nero picked up on that and continued it and made it worse. And in fact, in the year 64 AD, Emperor Nero set an entire section of the city on fire. It was the section next to the Colosseum. He wasn't pleased with the structure of the buildings as well as the agricultural life over there. That was his excuse. It was a large section of the city he set ablaze. He was out of town when it happened, so people couldn't immediately blame him. So in the year 64 AD, now we call it the Great Fire of Rome. So he set it on fire. He also wanted enough space to build this statue of himself made of bronze. Um, it's called Colossus Neris, his huge statue. And his house would have been up on a hill here called the Domus Aris, this is the House of Gold. So he wouldn't even have to go to the Colosseum to watch these games. He could literally see inside the Colosseum from his house. He was crazy rich and crazy wicked and just crazy too. So this year, 64, 64 AD, he needed to blame a certain group of people in the city for starting this fire, and he chose the Christians. So since Peter and Paul were the leaders of the Christians at the time, so they were going to get the, the heavy part of the blame, St. Paul himself was a Roman citizen, part of the great Roman Empire. He was originally called Saul, and he was born in Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus. And Tarsus is now present-day Turkey, but back then it was part of this huge Roman Empire, and basically the center of the world at the time. And it's important that he was a Roman citizen, because he wasn't allowed to be killed within the city walls of the capital, Rome itself. So he was beheaded on the south side of, of the city walls, and uh, it's a beautiful, yet very gruesome uh, account of his death. So, his head, it is said, bounced three times, but uh, springs of water shot up from each of those three spots. So if you go to Rome today, you can visit Tre Fontane, the, the place of the three fonts where, where Paul was beheaded, and now he's got a basilica there where you can visit his grave. St. Peter, on the other hand, he was a fisherman from Galilee, uh, so not a Roman citizen. He could be killed within the city walls. That's what Emperor Nero chose to do, and he was killed at a familiar place to us, the Vatican Hill. That's where Peter was executed. And uh, it happened that he didn't want to be killed in the same manner as his Lord. That's the tradition. So he said, please crucify me, but upside down. So that is the beautiful depiction of Caravaggio. If you go to Rome today, or in the next two years, we'll go to Piazza del Popolo, and we'll go look at this photo, or this, this painting, rather. And then right next door is one of the best gelaterias in the city. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite because they have eggnog whipped cream. <laughs> in any case, that's where this is in the city. In, a very popular place for tourists. He was executed upside down. His disciples wanted to bury him very quickly so the Roman authorities wouldn't know the spot of his burial. So because of the upside down part of his crucifixion, they had a lot of nails in his feet. It's a little gruesome here. And they were really loose with their corpses, so they simply chopped off his feet. And his disciples rushed him to a nearby necropolis at the Vatican Hill. And this necropolis uh, was not Christian at all in nature. 
Um, there were all these Roman pagans there, and so nothing about his grave originally looked Christian. There were no Christian symbols, because the goal was hide this among all the other pagan tombs going on. So in Rome, <clears throat> to make a distinction, there are, there's an Acropolis, and then there's a catacomb. So a necropolis is a city of the dead. That's what the word means. So it's basically streets and streets of mausoleums. But catacombs is something you dig into the dirt. So what we're going to be seeing where Peter was crucified was streets and streets of huge mausoleums. Um, again, we're going to jump ahead 300 years. This is a lot of history right now and a lot of names and facts. The goal isn't that you remember all this. It's that you get the overall narrative and see how the Holy Spirit has, in fact, preserved the bones of Peter through all of this mess of all these centuries. So this is a familiar symbol to us. Um, in the year 312 AD, uh, Emperor Constantine met his rival Emperor Maxentius on the Milvian Bridge in Rome. So two rival emperors, whoever was going to win this battle would be able to proclaim himself Caesar Augustus of the West, which meant whoever won was going to rule the world. And before this battle, Constantine, we call him the good guy now, saw this in the sky. That's what he said. So this is called the Chi Rho. I call it the P and the X because I speak <laughs> English. But Chi Rho would be the Chi, and then the Rho is the P. It's uh, they're Greek letters. So he saw this in the sky and heard a voice say to him, "In hoc vinces," which is Latin for "In this you are going to win." In this sign, you are going to conquer this battle, get to the other side of the Milvian Bridge, and rule the world. And that's what happened. So he put this sign on all the armor of his soldiers, and they beat Maxentius' army really handily. Um, they got to the other side. He proclaimed himself the Augustus of the West. And he wanted to know whose sign is this, because he wanted to build a grand temple to whatever god gave him this victory. <laughs> so he asked the wise people in Rome at the time, and they said, well, it's got to be the Christian god. Because Chi and Rho, those are the first two letters of the word Christos, Christ, in Greek. So they said, obviously, it's got to be the Christian God. So Constantine builds a basilica, but he builds uh, the Basilica of St. John Lateran. This is on the way opposite side of the city from the Vatican Hill. The Basilica of St. John Lateran, so a couple things about it. Um, you've probably heard of this before. It's actually named after two St. John's, St. John the Evangelist and St. John the Baptist. And the latter in family is the one who paid for this basilica to be built. They were a wealthy family at the time of Constantine. So there is no saint called St. John Lateran. If you pray to John Lateran, nobody, nobody hears that. <laughs> you, can hear, you can pray to John. And John. So this is basilica of St. John Lateran. Um, this chair back here in the apse, that's only for the Pope to sit in. That's this is considered the cathedral of the whole city of Rome. It was the first basilica built in Rome. Um, and then over here is a painting a little blurry of Constantine seeing the Cairo in the sky. So he built this basilica, and the Christians were pleased with it, but they still did most of their more important worship at the Vatican Hill in this pagan necropolis. So Constantine inquired and said, I build you this nice basilica. Why aren't you using it so much? And they said they would prefer to have their important worship ceremonies at the Vatican Hill at the tomb of their very first pope. And so he said, okay, I'll build another basilica. So that's what he did. He built the second basilica in Rome. And this is the original basilica of St. Peter, finished in the early to mid-300s. This one on your left here would obviously be the new basilica, but I've included it because the obelisk in here is really important. So that obelisk was the crowning piece of this dirt track that was called the Circus of Nero. So when Peter was executed, he was, so he was crucified upside down in this track called the Circus of Nero, and the obelisk there was the crowning piece of it. Now we put a cross on it and stick it in the middle of the square. It's a great image of Christianity triumphing over pagan Rome. But so that, that would have been the last thing Peter would have laid eyes on. And uh, that obelisk is right here. It's part of the original basilica. Another cool thing about this obelisk, not so much relevant to the scavi, but is that it, it came from Egypt. So it weighed tons and tons, so it was hard to transport. But it was from the part of Egypt where Jews lived. So it's very likely that when Mary, Joseph, and Jesus flew to Egypt, after, well, flew. <laughs> anyway, when they went to Egypt, after Joseph, after Joseph received in a dream that you got to do this because the king's trying to kill your baby. Um, they would have tried to be with other Jews, other family and people who thought alike. 
And this obelisk was in that part of Egypt. So maybe even Jesus saw that as like a one-year-old. So now it's in the middle of St. Peter's Square today. But back to the narrative. So Constantine builds this grand basilica. Uh, the legend goes it took six years to build. But the new basilica took 110 years to build with our new technology in the 1500s when they did that. So I don't know if it actually took more than six years, but that's what we say, and that's what's in the books. So that's Constantine's Basilica. That's where the Christians would have come. And Peter's tomb would have been way back here at the far end of it. That's where the, the main altar would have been. And the goal for Constantine was to build this grand basilica immediately over the site of Peter's tomb. But like I said, Peter was buried in a necropolis on Vatican Hill. So firstly, there are a whole lot of mausoleums they're going to have to fill in in order to build a giant Christian temple over it. But it's also on a hill. So all of Constantine's men had to take this Vatican Hill and just fill dirt in and flatten it out. So that's what we see today. So when we talk about the Vatican, it's technically one of the great hills of Rome, but there's nothing hilly about it today. It's all, it's all flat, thanks to what they did in the 300s. Okay, so immediately, I'll explain these photos here. Immediately below that grand altar that Constantine built in the 300s, um, like yards and yards into the dirt, was Peter's burial ground. It was Pope Sylvester at the time who told Constantine, okay, I'll give you the, the general idea of where the bones are. Because the Pope wanted to get the altar right. They didn't want to have this grand basilica and have things off by a few yards. So it was a big deal for the Pope to give away the, the burial site to this Roman emperor who at the time wasn't even Christian. This is what Peter's tomb looked like about 60 years after he was killed. So it's that with the red wall on it, if you're looking at the other screens. And it's not all that large, so where the, the white altar part comes out is about my waist high. And there's nothing Christian about it. There are no symbols. They're still keeping his bones, his, the burial place, quiet. Um, so what would happen here is Peter's bones would be where this little box is here. They'd be under there. So this is the first a documented proof we have of Christians worshiping over the site of a saint's relic. So that's where this tradition comes from. In a lot of churches around town, you'll have saint's relics either in the altar or below it. And this was the original idea of where that came from. So the Christians had to be sly and sneaky about when they were doing their worship here. You see there's a, a window right above the altar here. So as the priest is offering the mass for everybody, he has his back to them, he's facing east. There would be somebody hanging out on the other side of this red wall. So if the Roman authorities spotted their worship, he'd just simply pass the bread and wine through and everybody would quietly disperse and go along their business in the necropolis. So this, this red wall, is immediately below the big altar that Constantine built. What you see with the, the black and white photo up top, you'll, you'll start to see the Vatican Hill. The, the incline isn't all that dramatic in this photo, but basically where the the pointy things are, that's the Grand Baltacino that now stands above the altar at St. Peter's. Um, St. Peter was buried near the very top of Vatican Hill, so this decline goes all the way for actually a quarter mile. So when you're standing in St. Peter's Square looking at the Basilica, you're standing over streets and streets of old mausoleums. They've just chosen not to excavate them yet because the whole idea was to find Peter's bones, not do a whole lot of excavation. In here now, is the, the chapel between this right here, this red wall, and then the altar today where Pope Francis celebrates Mass. So a lot of information, but the gist of this is the big altar was right above where Peter's bones were. That's what this slide is saying. Now the trophy of Gaius, really random name, it seems, for this red wall here. But Gaius was a priest about the year 200, who, when the Christians were deciding where to have Christian headquarters, uh, he inserted himself into the conversation and said, your arguments are that apostles went to your various locations, but my argument for you, for Roman primacy, why we ought to look to Rome and not to these other Episcopal sees, these other places where bishops are, is because I can show you the trophies, he calls them, of both Peter and Paul. He said, you can only show me the trophy of one apostle in your places. But I can show you the trophies of two of them in Rome. That was his argument. And he was referring to the trophy of Peter, but now we call it the trophy of Gaius, name it after him. So when the excavators began their project, they knew they had to find the trophy of Gaius in order to find Peter's bones. The new St. Peter's Basilica was 
completed in 1526. Um, it was the late, well, the early 1400s actually, when the Pope at the time, Pope Julius II, decided, all right, we need to build another one because this one's kind of crumbling. Like I said, this took 110 years to build, but the important thing to know here is they kept the location of the high altar exactly where it was. So Peter's grave is way down here, and now where the high altar is today, where Pope Francis celebrates Mass, is probably about 12, 13 yards removed from where the bones are, the, the location of his burial, but it's still right above the spot through all these centuries. Okay, now we actually get into the narrative. How did we find bones? What was the whole story? Well, it's actually a more recent project than I thought before I gave these tours. So Pius XI, he's over there on the far side, he passed away in 1939. And in his will, he said that he wanted to be buried uh, near the bones of St. Peter, the Pope. And at the time, it was written in this book where the Popes write a history of what's going on in the church called the Liber Pontificalis, the, the, it's the history book for Popes to write in. Um, it was simply stated that, okay, Peter's buried beneath the high altar of St. Peter's. Um, well, he, he wanted a little more verification than that. So his successor, Pius XII, gave the go-ahead to start digging in a level right beneath the main, the main level of St. Peter's. And as soon as they started digging, they were trying to build him a burial spot first. The ground fell through, and they ended up into a mausoleum that obviously Constantine's crew hadn't filled in very well, because they could see the entire thing in all of its grand colors. So it's thanks to Pius XI, who really wanted this to happen, who after he died, inspired his successor, Pius XII, to start digging down there. And in 1941, Pius XII gave the go-ahead to start checking out this whole area. Because they knew that the basilica had been built over this necropolis, but they, they didn't actually want to check for sure. And a lot of the things we read is simply because they didn't want this grand disappointment in the world of Christendom. I'm like, well, whoops, Peter's bones aren't actually there. <laughs> so this is in the middle of World War, World War II, obviously. So in 1941, he wanted to keep the project in-house. So Pius XII put two priests who had some archaeological background in charge of the project, Monsignor Kirschbaum, Monsignor Koss. And then the rest of the priests, there were six of them, I had no archaeological experience. They just simply promised the Pope that they wouldn't tell a soul. So not the best people to have on a project. We priests study philosophy and theology, not archaeology. Um, so that was Pius XII. Eventually, these two will come into play later in the talk. But John XXIII, obviously the big player in the Second Vatican Council. And then Paul VI got to give the last say on whether or not these really are the bones of Peter. Okay, so finally getting into the excavations. So we have the tomb of the Catani family and the tomb of the Valerius family. These are two uh, ancient Roman families. They were both, the, the fathers of these families were both slaves at one point. They bought their freedom and hired a lot more slaves. Um, so that was the history of ancient Rome. Both of these mausoleums could hold up to, it had the potential to hold up to over 150 people. Wow. Both full body burials and cremations. Uh, both of these were three stories high. So when they were leveling off Vatican Hill, Constantine's workers just got chopped off the top two levels, and, and that's how they constructed the basilica above them. Um, these are very, very important for the excavators, though. These are about 50 yards away from Peter's burial spot. And when they got to these tombs, they knew they were pagan tombs, so non-Christians. But there were some Christian symbols in them. And in fact, the tomb right next to it had the full body remains of a Christian woman. They knew that by the inscriptions around her head, basically. There were some crosses and some fishes, actually. Um, so they had to figure out what's going on, why are there Christian symbols in here? Well, one of the leading hypotheses is that, in fact, even though the Romans didn't like to disturb their dead, Emperor Constantine knew that the, the pagans wouldn't be thrilled that there was about to be this grand Christian temple built above the tombs of their loved ones. So he invited these people, the pagans, to come in and for three days remove their dead. And as they did that, all the Christians came in and used their tombs to bury their own Christian remains, their own family members. And the way we know that is simply because of all the Christian inscriptions. This is my favorite um, example of sort of baptizing a grave that was already there. So this chariot used to belong to Apollos, 
Um, and uh, the Christians came in and put a cross around his head, a little halo, and turned it into Jesus. Now we call this Christos here. That's the, 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 the song, basically. Another thing about Soul Invictus, not immediately relevant to the Scabby, but since this shows up uh, in, in the tunes, it's relevant. So uh, the Soul Invictus is a great um, argument against the Christian celebration of, of Christmas, December 25th. And people will say the Christians chose December 25th because Sol Invictus was the day the sun god was born in ancient Rome. But we don't have documentation of this celebration of Sol Invictus. It's almost 300 years after Christ was born. So it seems that they were using our celebration, December 25th, to, to celebrate their own sun god. So don't let anybody take the church from me. I guess it's the left of the Anyway, we baptized that image. Now it's Jesus instead of Apollos. Monsignor Ludwig Koss. So we have a bunch of priests in charge of this project, Monsignor Kirschbaum, Monsignor Fuera, Monsignor Koss. You don't have to remember any of these names. Monsignor Koss, he came in, he did have some archaeological background, and was not thrilled with the way his priests, well, the, the team of priests, were, were treating some of these remains. Because as soon as they knew they were getting close to the tomb, the, the work started to speed up a lot faster, and they were simply tossing things, not documenting things. And then you notice they were also just tossing ashes and bones. Not cool to disturb the dead like that. So Monsignor Koss comes in here every evening, and he would box up the remains and store them, document them exactly where he found them and how he found them, and basically put them in a closet so he could give them all a proper burial at a later date. Um, that'll be very important in a couple of slides. This right here, the nickname is Street of the Dead. This is where, when I give tours, this is the long part. So this is about a 60-yard street where I start right where we're looking, and we just walk that direction until we hit St. Peter's tomb. Okay, so Monsignor Koss um, was part of the project before this woman, Dr. Margarita Guarducci, one of the best Italian names. She's from Florence, and she didn't join the project until they were already near the tomb of Peter, actually. So they brought the Pope downstairs because the altar and this grand structure called a baldacchino above the altar was starting to make the floor above them crumble. So they brought the Pope down here to say, well, we've come really, really close to the bones of Peter. We're not sure if we should go any further because we don't want to disturb the upper part of the Basilica. That's when Dr. Guarducci joined the project. So they slowed things way down so she could actually decipher what they now call graffiti on the wall, these scratches that they were trying to figure out what was going on. So Dr. Guarducci's specialty was ancient languages. Um, so among those would have been Latin and Greek. And those were both languages that were spoken in the Roman Empire at the time. She comes in and she finds a lot of inscriptions on these walls, nothing immediately telling her that Peter is around. So they start digging and digging even further, and finally they encroach upon the trophy of Gaius. So they see one of those marble pillars holding up that altar with that red background. And they said, wow, this is what Peter's tomb is supposed to look like. And in 1949, uh, news leaked to the New York Times that the Catholic Church had found the bones of Peter, and in fact we hadn't. So <laughs> it took a year later for Pius XII to get on the radio and say, actually, get excited, we found the tomb of Peter, we haven't found his bones. That's a really tough announcement to have to make. But Dr. Guarducci stayed on the project, um, she kept deciphering things, and as they got closer to the trophy of Gaius, she saw all sorts of things that were scratched on top of each other among which was this right here. So you'll recognize the Kai Ro right here, but she kept seeing these three lines sticking out. So eventually deci she deciphered that this looks like a key. Uh -huh. And this is how the, the early Christians were able to tell that this is Peter's tomb without saying his name, without giving anything away. She found this on a wall right next to the trophy of Gaius. This was here along with a lot of M's, excuse me, a lot of crosses, um, eyes for the name of Jesus in, in Latin, Jesu. Um, but this was everywhere. There were almost over 20 of these on the same wall. So she said, we've got to be getting close. And that is where uh, the 16th chapter uh, of Matthew comes into play. So I'm going to read uh, a good portion of that right now. This is from the Gospel of Matthew. It says, when, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, 
other is Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said in reply, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. So, we're going to spend a little time with this passage here. So, firstly, Peter receives the keys to the kingdom of heaven, which is what the early Christians were trying to show by that Cairo and the three lines sticking out. That is an immediate fulfillment of a prophecy in Isaiah. Chapter 22, verse 22. This is where a king is speaking to his stewards about what's going to happen next. He writes, And I will place on his shoulder, talking about his new steward, I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. So the prophet Isaiah, unbeknownst to him, was talking about papal succession way, way before Jesus ever walked the earth. And then Matthew's gospel is showing this is the fulfillment of the key of the house of David. And so we're on Holy Father number 266 right now, Pope Francis. So 266 men in the line of St. Peter have received the key of the house of David, the keys to the kingdom. And it says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's what Matthew says. And then you heard the similar expression in Isaiah. Whatever is shut will stay shut. If it's open, it will be open. Well, that is... Uh, rabbinic tool, so it comes from rabbis, and there are three parts to that authority. So the first is a teaching authority. We look to our Holy Father, today Pope Francis, to help us out to know faith and morals, to know right from wrong when things get messy. The second is a juridical authority. So the Pope is the only one who can single-handedly change the codes of canon law. That, that didn't come from Sinai. The, the Ten Commandments did, but the Pope is able to say, well, maybe this code would be better than that code. He's obviously got advisors helping him out with that. And then the third part of the authority is loosing and binding sins. So when you go to confession, the sins are gone. And that comes from the power of the keys that Peter, our Holy Father, Jesus first giving it to him, has chosen to give to, to all the priests in the world. So those are the three, the three pieces of the keys of the house of David, the keys of papal authority. Finally, we have the bones. Ta-da! We, uh, so I advertised this. I find out what's in the box. Well, I'm in the box. Ooh, so you the bones. But uh, it was actually a really dramatic story when they got really close. So obviously news leaked to the New York Times. And uh, they didn't actually say until 18 years later that we have found the bones of Peter. So when they found these bones, first they found <laughs> remains uh, right beneath the altar where I pointed out in that trophy of Gaius where there is that open section beneath the altar. And they had them tested by Dr. Carenti of Palermo, Sicily, who was a great anthropologist at the time. And the results came back after four years. And he said, actually, these bones that you found are the bones of three individuals. Two were women, and the man was too old to be Peter. So not good. And there were also horse bones and, uh, and actually a rat. <laughs> so, yeah, none of those were Peter. A big, big blow to the project. So this is in 1962. And uh, that's when Dr. Guarducci's work was really picking up. And she was just stunned because everything around this wall with the keys and the M's and the crosses had pointed to this is Peter's burial spot. Well, she found a little niche here in the wall that was empty. And she had to figure out what was going on. Because all around this niche were those keys, were the, the Cairo, the three lines sticking out. And in fact, very close by were the words Petrus Eni means Peter is within. She's like, he's, he's got to be around here somewhere. Well, she did some inquiring. Monsignor Koss had passed away at this time. Monsignor Koss is the guy who would come in at night and box things up and storm together. <coughs> and she asked one of his secretaries, okay, did you find anything in this little niche in the wall? And he said, in fact, we did. He would come in in the evenings, box things up, and you know, do his thing. She said, well, we got to go find those. So they, they found them, because it was 
ordered very neatly, and they had those sent to Palermo, Sicily, again, to this Dr. Carenti guy. And uh, again, it took some years. The results came back this time. And these bones are the remains of a robust male in his late 60s, and everything was present from his head to his ankles. Or there was at least a fraction of a bone present from his head to his ankles. So his feet were completely missing, which matches the narrative that Peter was in fact crucified upside down. They chopped off his feet and buried him very quickly. And they also found some other things. They found that there was some dye remaining on these bones of purple and gold. And what that told them was these bones at one point had been wrapped in, in royalty, in wow. royal materials, purple and gold, um, which doesn't make sense, right? Because the disciples quickly buried him. But what they pieced together is when Constantine was building his basilica, he must have seen these bones himself and given Peter a very proper royal burial. But now I have to figure out why were they in this niche and not exactly where all the Christians thought they were. And what we believe is this, what Dr. Guarducci came up with is this, that Pope Sylvester at the time, although he gave the location of the bones to Emperor Constantine, he didn't want to give him the exact location. So after these bones were wrapped in their purple dye, he had basically decoy bones put in this central grave and Pope Sylvester had slipped them into this wall. Because if you're going to build a grand basilica, you still want the altar right above the relics. Uh, in any case, there were many, many attempts at sacking Rome from different barbarians from the east and the west all throughout the early centuries. And then the Roman authorities could have come in any day and been really upset with the Christians and just ruined the bones, desecrated everything that was left of Peter. So instead, he was buried very humbly in this little wall here. Um, so for all of those reasons, we say that these are, in fact, the bones of Peter. We, and I say, Pope Francis also said that. He said that in 2013, once again. These are, in fact, the bones of St. Peter, our, our first pope. Uh, another way they verified this is they found dirt on these bones that matched the Vatican clay in that, in that grave right beneath the altar. And uh, as the years went on, that necropolis, like I said, was filled in with a lot of dirt. So there's a lot of dirt from all different areas of Rome. But the fact that this these bones match that Vatican clay, it means that he at one point was buried right beneath that altar when Pope Sylvester came in and sort of saved the day and moved him to just slightly away from it. This is about two yards away from where that central grave is, so still right, right below the altar. So in 2013, Pope Francis was elected Pope in March of that year, and in November of 2013, he had this grand mass in the middle of St. Peter's Square, and he held the bones of St. Peter, asking for his intercession for his pontificate. Um, and that breathed new life into the Scotty tours, and we get a lot of requests. Um, and they say, actually, Pope Francis was a great factor in that, showing the world these bones, now people want to go visit them. At that very liturgy, he gave nine fragments of these bones to the Patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew, so that's significant. This patriarch is not in communion with the Roman Catholic Church. He's Eastern Orthodox. Nonetheless, he wanted to give some of these bones of Peter, our unifying figure of Christianity, to the Eastern Orthodox. To say, hey, let's, let's not have a thousand years of schism. Let's, let's have some dialogue and communion with one another. This over here is the tomb of Pius XI. So he, in fact, got his wish to be buried the closest to St. Peter's bones. Once they found the bones... They built him a beautiful sarcophagus, and it's literally a stone thrown away uh, from where St. Peter is buried today. <laughs> now what we're looking at here is called the Confessio. So pretend like you're in St. Peter's Basilica right now. There's gold all around us, really, really high ceilings. And if you're right here in front of the altar, you can look down. There are all these candles around you. You look down, and you see what's called the Confessio. And the Confessio is the other side of, of Peter's tomb. So we saw that red wall where the altar sticks out, or on the other side, where the guy would have taken the bread and wine and everybody would have dispersed. That's where we are. And at the Confessio, we have a, a close-up image here of Jesus, this beautiful mosaic of Jesus. Um, every time, well, every year, that Pope Francis names someone an archbishop, he sends them what's called a pallium. It's that black and white thing that Archbishop Lucas will wear around his neck when he celebrates Mass. It's a pallium. And all the pallium, the pallio rest right at this confessio the night before they're flown all throughout the world so that they're showing unity with our Holy Father in Rome. 
So Peter, as he said, is first among the other apostles. He's still a bishop, but he's first among equals, is the language of the Second Vatican Council. So that shows Roman primacy. It also recognizes that archbishops appeal to the Pope's authority and none other, and the Pope is only appealing to the authority of Jesus Christ. And here we have so just a few things to note. So St. Peter, who is crucified between the years 64 and 67 AD, I think I maybe failed to mention that, but the Great Fire of Rome was in 64. And all throughout the centuries, even though there was a big mess in the 1100s, we had three popes going on and none of them liked each other. And even today we have two popes, they both like each other, thank God. But one is emeritus and one is acting. Um, for all these years, the bones of Peter have remained untouched until 1941 when we started digging for it. So that, even though our faith doesn't rely on these popes, not, these, these bones, excuse me, not being disturbed, it's still a really, really cool thing. It's cool to be Catholic for awesome reasons like this. And now we have Pope Francis today, the 266th successor of, of Peter. Um, so going back to my vocation story at the beginning, so yeah, John Paul II meant a lot to me in 2005, and I've grown an affection for all the Holy Fathers in my lifetime. So I read a lot of Joseph Ratzinger, now Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, particularly Jesus of Nazareth, and then some of his treatises on the liturgy and liturgical formation of seminarians. And then Pope Francis is now my next door neighbor. <laughs> You're probably wondering where I am. So, uh, so with that, I'll open it up for questions, and we'll certainly be done before 8.30. So thank you very much. So, we'll take some time, maybe about 15, 20 minutes for questions, and then, and then we'll, we'll be finished for the evening. So, so far away, you're free to ask me about the Scavi, about Rome, seminary life, um, just anything that might have piqued your interest. Yeah. So did they put the bowls back in that same little niche? Thanks for asking. Yeah, so... What happened was, during the excavations, they had these bones in a wooden box uh, stored away in a closet at Vatican City. And then when they realized they needed to go look at those again, they, when they came back, they had a special see-through box built for it. So when they had the see-through box built, that's when they put it in the little niche. And the, the way they buried them is cool, too. So the bones in the front are the jaw bones of St. Peter, because it was his jaw that first proclaimed Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So yeah, they're, they're exactly as they were from the year about 330 and on. Yeah, they're just sitting in the little niche in there. It's awesome. Yeah. It's a very small box. It's a very small box. And when people visit the Scabby, they're always surprised at that. So I always have a little laser pointer to show them. Um, one person didn't believe me that it was Peter, and I didn't know what to tell him. But it was, it's, it's very, very small. So when you go in there, it's smaller than, it's about half the size of, of a shoebox you'd see on the shelf. Um, just centuries of decay, and that's, that's what you get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah they're, they're yellow, brownish, a little bit there. And so, yeah, you, you stand in this room, we call it the room of the bones, or the original. And it's the, the ground that you stand on, you can see where the excavators were at work. They're still doing some projects in the Scavi. When you go down there, you'll see vases of different colors and tools laying around. They're not actively excavating the scavi, but as you get closer to the bones, that's where things become a little more religious in nature and not so historical. But the reason they're still excavating is because they keep finding mentions of the location of these bones. So they found this guy, Herakla, wanted to be buried in Vaticum ad circa, which is at the Vatican, at the circus. So the Vatican Hill near, near a circus. So they're still doing stuff like that just to confirm, well, okay, we have the location right, but there's still a quarter mile of stuff they haven't seen and, and they're done there. That's just awesome. Yeah. Did they have to dig out the whole way to the bones? They have to dig out the what? The whole way down to the bones? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. So when they immediately got to the trophy of Gaius, um, they, they stopped because the floor was crumbling on them and they haven't even actually dug out and they're not going to an entire half of the Trophy of Gaius, that red wall. So when they saw one column, they stopped everything and stopped using power tools. So they dug all the way through ground, dirt, basically just earth, to get to where they thought the central grave was. So when they found those bones and it came up empty, then they started looking at the walls to see where the inscriptions are. Um, but there, there's a lot around his grave that is actually untouched, and they're not going to touch it. 
because they've already found the crowning, crowning piece of the project. Yes? Are there other popes buried? That's, yeah, um, thanks. So well. in St. Peter's Basilica are 91 popes who are buried there. Um, and so we have 91 popes, about 13, I think it's 13 of them are in the upper part of the basilica, and all of the rest are in the lower part. So Paul VI, for example, is buried in the lower part of the basilica, but people think he's going to be moved up soon so that people can go venerate his tomb. But yeah, he's, Pius XI is next to a whole lot of other popes down there. And so like right when John Paul II died, he was buried in that lower part where about 70-some you know, are buried, and then as <laughs> devotion grows more popular, they move them upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> is Pope John the Twenty Third uh, under a uh, altar in the... Uh... He is. I... <sighs> Yeah, so you can go right up to him, and people aren't sure if his, I'll say it like this, so the Italians really, really love John the Twenty Third. Um, he, he was Archbishop of Venice for a while, and they have a great love and devotion for him, and so it's always Italians flocking to his tomb, so it's just hard to see, actually. Um, but his face looks rather preserved, they put a nice wax covering, you can walk right up to him and see him. So he's up there. Um, Pius X is now upstairs, and you can go see his tomb. So he's right across from John Paul II. If you're in Rome in the next couple of years, let me know, and we'll go have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Holy Holy again. Yes? Can you talk about how you get on the scouting tour? Yeah, that, thanks for asking. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, right now, uh, I'm the guy who actually coordinates all the scouting tours for Americans coming to Rome. So if you go online and type in your American trying to you know, schedule a tour, there's a fancy email address, and I'm on the other side of that. So uh, basically, yeah, you email um, that link that you'll find in a ton of places online. And uh, they're, they're rather hard to get in, so if you're coming to Rome, make sure you schedule it once in advance. And then um, we'll definitely try to have you with one of our seminarian tour guides. I'm one of four other guys who gets this work. So, in Rome, at the North American College where I study, we all have different apostolates. And most of the apostolates are, are teaching around the city, usually teaching in English, um, usually people who are in the military who have family in Rome and they want us to go teach their children. Um, I, I think I have the coolest apostolate um, at the Scabby, but they're all, they're all great. And so, yeah, I, I signed up for this one and that's how I got it. And now, yeah, if you're trying to schedule a tour, just email that fancy address and I'll definitely try to I'll try to schedule a tour that I can give for you. There was another hand over here. That was me. I was just oh, gonna yeah. ask like if that was your passion and that's how you learned that or how you were assigned to that. Yeah, yeah. So the they emphasize our apostolic life in theological formation. So we're not just at our desk studying all day. And they we're still lay people in formation. And the apostolate of the lady, the work of the lady, the Second Vatican Council says, is the sanctification of the temporal order. So making holy the here and the now. And that's what we're asked to do. So when we go out in the city of Rome, we have a whole lot of ways of doing it, obviously, but formal ways are all the different apostles we can sign up for. So this is my, I would call my lay apostolate as a lay person in the church. I get to bring people to the bones of our first pope. But uh, we, have other, we have other guys who give tours of the different basilicas around, the upper part of the basilica, St. Paul's. Um, there's a beautiful church called the Church of the Jesu where guys have given tours before. But I, I applied for this one because I thought it was the coolest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes? I understood that the traditional excavation that is secret from Rome was occupied by... Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so... All of these excavations until 1968, when Paul VI got on the radio and told the world, we found the bones of Peter, were supposed to be kept quiet. Um, they weren't toward the end, but they were very fearful of Nazi occupation. In fact, it happened. Um, so actually, my, my campus at the North American has uh, a hand to play in helping out uh, the Jews in Rome. So Pius XII um, had his secretary, Cardinal Montini, who later became Paul VI. He, while he was in charge of this project, he halted it while there was fear of Nazi invasion and put Paul VI in charge of helping all of the Jewish children in the city of Rome. So in fact, it was not only secret, but it stopped for a little bit during the Second World War. And uh, a cool part of what Paul VI did when he was Secretary Montini was he 
dressed these Jewish children up like shepherds, and he took them to what's now my campus at the Janiculo Hills, the North Virginia College. But at the time, it was simply land, and there was a convent up there. So Cardinal Montini took all these shepherd-looking Jewish children and stuck them in this convent, and the books say there are literally thousands of them who were saved thanks to Paul VI. Um, and so once the Nazis finally left Rome, that's when all these children got out. And then it was only like two years later that the American bishops decided to, to take this property and build our new seminary. <coughs> so yeah, in fact, it was secret. And uh, yeah, they, they used American soil for it, you could say. Um, yeah. Before you close, uh, yeah, yeah. I wish you would uh, introduce your parents and your grandparents. My fam is over in the corner. Yeah, it was very kind of them to come. They're all my parents, they're all my grandparents. Claire and Max over there. Yeah. Yeah. So we're up this up in a few minutes here. But yeah, it's been great to be home because I was in Rome for two years straight. So now I get to see them quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. I understand through the grapevine that you're uh, learning Italian. I, I like to say I've learned it. I, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can say I have to. Yeah. I, I think so. Yeah. I, um, yeah, the first year was crazy hard. But um, we, we study in Italian over there. So me and all my classmates, there are 30 of us who flew over there uh, two years ago during the heart of COVID. So it was nuts. Um, so we, we got there. We quarantined for five months in our seminary. Uh, but it's a beautiful campus. But yeah, we, we study at the Gregorian University, uh, founded by, well, it's named after Gregory the 13th. Um, and it was founded by Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, so it's kind of cool. Um, and then Robert Bellarmine, the great saint, got this university going, so I study in a really cool place. The, the hard part is it's not my, my mother tongue. And so, yeah, the first year was crazy hard, but um, this I worked my tail off last summer to learn Italian in the north of Italy. Well, things are still very much locked down over there. And uh, yeah, this past year was way more comfortable. So yeah, now I know a little Italian. Yes. Oh, are you doing Gregorian chants? We do some of that, yeah. Oh, boys. <laughs> yeah, 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 we have a nice choir at the seminary, actually, and we just got a new director. So yeah, so where I go, the full name is the Pontifical North American College. And I'll, I'll spend four years over there, having done already four years of philosophy. And yeah, I'm very much involved in our, in our choral program over there. I keep music going. That's one of my, my great loves, music and Jesus. Those are really high on my, my list. Well, cool. I think, uh, well, I'll close this evening in a prayer. Feel free to help yourselves to the last, last cookies and water. Um, right before I started this talk, uh, a gentleman came in here and he handed me uh, the relic of St. Peter the Apostle. So oh, here wow. so I said he'd be welcome to come up here and venerate it. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd share that. It's all I'll leave it there. Um, okay, let's pray, and then yeah, and then I'll, I'll certainly chat with you afterwards. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, give you thanks and praise for the unifying figure you've given us, Peter. Peter, who's spoken through many, many popes and all the way to this present day through Pope Francis. Keep us in communion with one another, Father. Grant us the grace of of unity, peace, love. Grant us the grace that we would be uh, a church in communion, a church in dialogue with one another, and a church that can look to, to St. Saint, to Saint Peter as, as a, a great pillar, pillar of unity for us. And Father, we pray to you as our children. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Amen. Don't wait here. Stick around if you want to chat some more. Have a good evening.